Instead of canceling, try pausing. A timeout happens if some part of a system was trying to do something or was listening for something and it abandons the effort because too much time has passed. So start a task and then pause it. Keep it paused until just before or just after a delay that should cause a timeout. And then unpause the task. What happens? I did a lot of this testing with phone systems. If you time the unpause just right, one part of the system knows that the delay has exceeded the timeout period, while another part of the system knows the delay did not exceed the timeout. So it tries to continue the task. These types of mismatch triggered all sorts of mischief. Another example of interference testing has to do with swapping the running program out of memory. It's easy enough to do if you're a system that allows you to have bunches of programs that run at the same time. Change your focus from the program that's running to the other programs until finally the system pages the program under test to disk. Now that it's inactive, try some mischief. Make a change to the system parameters or move one of the program's data files. Then refocus on the program under test. Bring it back into memory. Will it recognize your changes and cope with them appropriately? You can also interfere with a program by making it compete for its resources. The most famous competition bug is called the deadly embrace. Here's an example of how it works. Process 1 opens a file and is updating it. To complete the update, it needs access to the data in file 2. But process 2 is updating file 2. And of course, to finish its update, it needs access to file 1. Now, if the processes have locked the files, then process 1 can't read file 2 until process 2 is done with it. And process 2 can't be done with it till it reads file 1, which process 1 isn't done with until process 2 is done with file 2. These processes are never going to finish. Anytime you can create competition between two processes for the same resource, you have an opportunity to cause a failure. Pay attention to the timing of the requests for resources and the priority that the operating system assigns to each process. So much for interference testing. Now let's consider error handling. When a program detects an error, it might not just issue an error message. It might stop what it's doing in the middle of a complex task. It doesn't necessarily clean up memory when it does this, so you might get memory leaks or a stack corruption. And if it was in the middle of updating a record, a record is a group of related variables, then it might corrupt the record by abandoning the update halfway through. For example, imagine copying your name, address, and phone number into a record. Halfway through, it stops. So now the record stores your name, half of your address, and the rest of the address and phone number from somebody else. The program didn't halt but its data is corrupt. Try to get a list of error messages or try to create one. Maybe you have to reverse engineer the program to find the list in the code. But once you have the list, make the program generate every message. Do it many times for every message. And check how much available memory you have as you do this. Track how long the program takes to recover. Track the time. Or how long it takes to do other tasks. Does the program gradually slow down? Does the amount of available memory gradually go down? If the program saves data to disk, check what's been saved. These are all examples of looking for side effects of error handling. When you find a bug, don't stop testing. Once the program has failed, it's in a state the programmer didn't intend. So what else can you do now that it's in this crazy state? This is a reminder from the bug advocacy course. When you find a bug, figure out how to make it worse. Maximize it so that when you write the bug report, you're presenting the bug in its most serious version. Some errors don't trigger an error message within the program. They trigger a problem that the operating system flags instead. So for example, try saving a file that's just barely too big to fit on the disk. The can't do that message probably comes from the operating system, not the program. But what does the program do about it? You can also try some fairly simple loader stress tests. You know, like if you're testing a web application, let's try connecting lots and lots of people to the application. Remember, we're doing quick testing here. This is testing you're doing without much knowledge of the program. You're doing it early. You're looking for obvious symptoms, routine errors. You're not doing competent load testing or competent performance testing. They require modeling. They require you to understand which operations of the program use which resources. Given that, you start developing user scenarios and usage scenarios. You figure out how to combine them a bunch of these, a bunch of those, so you put the system under an intended load. Well, you can't do that in quick testing because that takes way too much study and way too much work. It happens later when you understand the program. 
So for now, all you can do is overload the thing in really obvious ways and see if it's completely defenseless against that kind of thing. Instead of changing how the program works, change system details for the system the program runs on. For example, it turns out that some programs are hard-coded to expect their files to be on drive C. You want to know if this program has that problem? Set up a system with no drive C. See what happens. Programs use inputs together to create new outputs. Every variable is probably used with some other variables, maybe many variables. We'll study systematic ways to test variables together in Lecture 6. But from the point of view of quick testing, you're looking for easy to imagine bugs and easy to recognize relationships. Let's start with a pair of obvious ideas. First, look for impossible combinations, like February 30. The individual values, February and 30, they're fine. They'll pass the program's input filters. It's the combination, February with 30, that's invalid. Second, look for operations that you can do on more than one variable or object at a time. Confirm you can act on several things that are similar, and then try working with dissimilar objects. For example, multiply a matrix by a number. Concatenate a string with an array of strings. Move a picture and a paragraph together. Quick tests are a good starting point, especially when a product comes to you late in development, like what happens to external test labs. If you start late and you're on a tight schedule, quick tests help you find lots of bugs right away. This keeps the programmers busy fixing bugs for a while. They won't notice that while they're doing that, you've taken some time to learn the product well enough to test it more deeply. But quick tests are just a good starting point. These are the tests that are based on the generic errors, the bugs that show up in lots of programs, the bugs you can test for even though you don't know anything about this program. These are not the tests that you run to hunt bugs that are special to this program. These are specifically not the tests for the bugs that you won't know to look for until you gain a deeper understanding of what this product is. Exploratory testing is about learning new things throughout the testing process. Quick tests start that process, but just like tours, they don't take you to much depth. They don't take you to the depth that you're going to reach as you gain a deeper understanding of the product and its risks. When I introduce you to risk-based testing, I identify it as two core tasks. Imagine how the program can fail and test for that kind of failure. Quick tests rely on history. Some bugs are so common that every experienced tester knows about them, so they certainly can imagine these things as ways the program can fail. And they also have experience with tests that found them, so they know how to test for that kind of failure. GuideWords provide a different kind of tool. It's for expanding a tester's imagination for potential failures. GuideWords have a long history in the testing of safety critical systems. In the safety critical world, HAZOP is short for hazardous operations. This report on HAZOP guidelines provides a detailed but readable introduction to the use of guide words in HAZOP analysis. Think of guide words as a list of concepts that you want to apply when you analyze each part of the system under test. For example, your guide words might be a list of actions and objectives and risks. To use this, you break the system down into its components, and then you consider the components one by one. So when you focus on this component, you analyze it in terms of the guide words. For example, Suppose your component list includes every variable in the program, and your guide word list includes empty, small, and large. For each variable, you'd ask, well, what would happen if this was empty? What would happen if the value of this was very small? What would happen if it was very large? In each case, you'd consider whether the condition, empty, small, large, could cause a failure. And if so, what would the failure look like? People started applying HAZOPS to software in the 1990s. You'll see several academic papers on this in the reference list.